Welcome to our Profiles in Leadership series. This series offers an unparalleled opportunity to gain insights from top leaders who serve in government, education, the private sector, and civil society. In each episode, we invite these leaders to reflect on their journey and share skills, core values, and qualities that make them the leaders they are today. Today, I'm very pleased to have Peter Yu. Uh, Peter is Regents Professor of Law and Communication and of, and director of the Center for Law and Intellectual Property at Texas A&M University. Born and raised in Hong Kong, uh, Peter is a leading expert in international IP and communications law. He also writes and lectures extensively on international trade, international and comparative law, and the transition, the legal systems in China and Hong Kong. A prolific scholar and an award-winning teacher, he is the author or editor of seven books and more than 200 law review articles and book chapters. He is an elected member of the American Law Institute. His lectures and presentations have spanned over 30 countries on six continents. He is a frequent commentator in the national and international media, and his publications are available on his website at peteru.com, which we will include in the description below. So, Peter, let, I want to start with an article that uh, John Cross wrote about you. Uh, and it's available online. It's the University of Chicago Law Review, published November 2021. The title of the article is Lessons to be Learned from Peter Yu. And I just want to read a short paragraph from the start of his article about you where he says, Peter's reputation and influence are widely known among intellectual property scholars and need no further elaboration. But perhaps the more interesting question is why? What sets Peter's work apart from the work of others? What lessons can other scholars, especially junior scholars, wanting to make a name for themselves, learn from Peter's career path? So, what are your thoughts on those questions? So Daryl, uh, let me start by saying uh, thank you for having me over here. It's a pleasure to join um, um, uh, this series. Um, so I'm actually flattered uh, by what John said and um, I, um, I was surprised uh, when I saw the article because I was actually not uh, notified until it actually came out from the law review. Uh, I think what John carries very well in that article is that it's not just about uh, publishing a lot. It's not just about uh, trying to be very active in conferences. Uh, there are a lot of intangibles that we can actually um, uh, consider when we're trying to figure out how to actually uh, have an impact within the field. Uh, and I think um, there are different things that uh, we try to do, and sometimes it's just uh, not necessarily the easiest, uh, and sometimes it's not necessarily what you anticipate. I think most people who want to be leader in the field, but at the same time, they do not actually know exactly what they need to do, uh, and including myself, uh, I, I don't think I actually uh, start by uh, being actively involved in academia, thinking that eventually I will uh, get recognized by my peers and I'm actually uh, flattered uh, by uh, all this recognition. Uh, but as you, you probably know, anybody who comes from uh, outside the US and trying to be a professor, we are just trying very hard to actually make it. Uh, and so let's alone thinking about whether we will have impact in the field uh, and so I think that's true for a lot of people who actually go out there and try to do the best they can, uh, try to make sure that uh, they can work well with others, uh, they earn the respect of others. Uh, and I think um, whatever happens is entirely um, out of our control. So uh, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, and we are glad that it happens. Thanks. Before we get into your scholarship, and I have several questions in that regard. I want to talk about your, your comment about coming from the outside. 
Now, reflecting on your career so far, what do you think were some of the inflection points that led you to your current success? Um, I think there are different things that I always try to do uh, whenever I uh, approach a project or I work with others. I think one of them is to make sure that uh, whatever you do, um, treat people the same way as you would expect to be treated, right? Uh, and I think it's very important uh, regardless of whether uh, you are starting your career or whether you are at a much uh, higher level, for example, at the mid-level, or uh, I'll probably think the same way when I'm close to retirement, right? I still um, remember those times where uh, it's not the easiest for a lot of uh, uh, scholars coming from abroad uh, to actually try to be active within the field. And so I always make sure that uh, everybody gets welcomed. Uh, and um, we, I, I just uh, want to make sure that I think uh, people, especially those who normally would not get attention within uh, academia will get some attention. Uh, because um, especially in the US, I think that's true in most other places as well, where academia is very hierarchical. And so a lot of times, uh, a lot of uh, people may not necessarily be in a good position uh, from the very beginning, uh, including those who are from abroad, uh, but then eventually they will be able to make important contribution within the field. Uh, so I think that would be quite important. I think it would also be quite important to think about how uh, we will eventually get a chance to work with others as long as you stay long enough within a career. Uh, and I think uh, that's definitely true in my case. I've taught in a number of different schools and some of the colleagues I used to work closely together in conferences or joint projects and are now my colleagues. Uh, and so this is not necessarily something I anticipate uh, when I first started, uh, but at the same time, if you're long enough within academia, you got to work with others. So what I'm hearing is people and relationships seem to be at the core of what you attribute your success to investing in people, treating them with respect and equally, and, and then collaborating with people. Is that correct? I think that's correct uh, in the sense that uh, it's a very important part of trying to be part of academia, trying to actually do something interesting, uh, both on your own and as well as with others. But I also think that it will be very important uh, for, uh, for us to actually work hard on our own uh, in terms of scholarship, in terms of different projects we do. So that's basically uh, two part of the story, right? So there are, there's the part where uh, I try to interact with a lot of people through uh, projects, through conferences, uh, through other collaborative opportunities. But there's also another part where I just see, basically sit in my house, uh, working hard on my articles and doing other things and not talking to anybody when I was working. Thanks. And I think many of our viewers would be surprised at that social part of it because people typically look at academia as a solitary enterprise. You're working on your own or to the extent that you have to then you work with other people. But I think anybody looking at your track record and we'll go into some of that 84 page CV that you have online, will see how much collaboration you've actually done over the years and consistently over the years. And now in John's article, he talks, and now going focusing on scholarship, he talks about your scholarship and in particular, he says that by casting the net so widely, Peter has developed a reputation as an authority on virtually any intellectual property topic. While not exactly one-stop shopping, Peter's work is of use to scholars dealing with numerous different topics. So talk about how you develop such a broad interest. Uh, you're known, of course, in copyright in, in the international IP field. Uh, as John notes, but even more broadly than that. And there are not too many scholars who do that. So where did that come from and how do scholars cultivate that? 
I think there's a difference between uh, intellectual public scholarship within the U.S. and intellectual public scholarship outside the U.S. I think in the U.S. we have the luxury of having a number of colleagues that will allow us to specialize in certain areas, uh, whereas outside the U.S. you don't have the same luxury. A lot of times you run into a colleague who would cover uh, all the different areas of IT, because that person is the only uh, person uh, in the faculty or, uh, or the senior person uh, 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 at that school. And so I think any of us who are trying to do more on international intellectual property will tend to get more into different areas and we will not specialize as much as others. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to do it and uh, different people uh, have their own preferences and they all do interesting work. Uh, but anytime we want to go into, um, for example, international IP, we'll end up uh, being more diverse uh, than others because if we are talking about something like intellectual property and human rights, we cannot just focus on one area of IP law. Same thing with respect to traditional knowledge, right? Uh, so I think in uh, uh, I think inevitably for a lot of us, we'll end up uh, focusing in different areas. Whenever I have to advise colleagues who are trying to um, focus on scholarship or think about how they can take the scholarship to the next level, I always encourage them to focus on at least three different areas where they can actually uh, make an important contribution. And for me, it's basically uh, number one about China, number two about international IP, and the third one would be about digital issues, uh, especially in the copyright area. And I think it will be important to focus on certain areas so that you can actually connect with others, you can uh, advance your scholarship, you can tie into a dialogue, whether within the US or elsewhere. Uh, and after that, then sometimes uh, people will branch out, uh, not um, what in the way they expected. Uh, and I think John also mentioned that a lot of people do not know that I actually started writing about human rights scholarship. Uh, no, no, I, and I've known you for about 20 years now. <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting. My first book is actually on Russian media law and policy, which I co-edited with my mentor, Amon Price and uh, Andrew Richter, who is from Moscow. Uh, and then I wrote quite a bit about uh, the uh, international uh, covenant on the civil and political rights uh, in, uh, in, uh, in relation to the succession uh, in Hong Kong, but Hong Kong went back to China. Uh, so those are my early pieces. Uh, and I was not expecting that I would actually go back into uh, the human rights field other than uh, looking at the tension between intellectual property and uh, freedom of expression. Uh, but in the mid 2000s, there's been a lot of uh, active debate, especially after the Committee on Economic, and Social, and Cultural Rights have. Uh, adopted General Comment Number 17, which is the interpretive comment about provision relating to IP. And since then, I've been doing a lot of scholarship on intellectual property and human rights. So this is a very good example that it was not what I set out to do. Well, I think it can probably uh, fit very well with international IP, uh, but now I actually spend quite a bit of time on intellectual property and human rights. Might, might you have, but for another career decision, been a human rights law professor? I think it will be uh, um, much more difficult uh, for me to um, be very active from the very beginning uh, because it requires a lot of um, uh, uh, knowledge. It requires a lot of experience uh, in order to uh, succeed in that field. I respect a lot of the human rights scholars and they've been doing decades of work uh, just trying to advance their goals or uh, do research in that area. I think intellectual property is somewhat different. And that's why if you look around, you can see a lot of our, our colleagues are basically uh, at the mid-level, at the junior level. Uh, and now, obviously, we have uh, uh, many colleagues who are at the senior level. But that was not the case uh, even when I started uh, in the early 2000s. There are a lot of people at the mid-level, and there are few people uh, at the senior level. and we just uh, had uh, a very nice retirement party over share drivers. And uh, we can see a lot of those pioneers who were there. Uh, 
uh, and uh, and clearly they do not have the same group of people that they can talk to when they started, right? So I think intellectual property is a field I think where a lot of uh, the junior uh, and mid level scholars can actually be very active, uh, and we also can make our own contributions uh, in the sense that we might be more familiar with the technology, we might be playing around with it, and our and uh, experience will be somewhat different uh, from the experience of our senior colleagues. So when we are doing um, uh, analysis on issues relating to, for example, social media, artificial intelligence, our analysis will be somewhat different and which will make the field more interesting. So do you think that the field is too crowded now? Or do you think this is the right number compared to where we were before? I think it's never crowded, right? We always want uh, more people to come in. Uh, I think the frustration, if I say it this way, is that I think we tend to gravitate towards certain issues and so we end up with a lot of people focusing on similar issues. That's why we think it's crowded. Uh, but there's still a lot of unexplored issues uh, that we hope that we actually can bring in more scholars uh, to work um, uh, in the field. Uh, I think we, it's just based on uh, uh, back of envelope count of, uh, of what we have. I think we have about uh, 200 or so ultra active IP scholars. Uh, we have between 200 to 600 who are somewhat active. And then we now, I think it's close to, uh, I would say um, either 800 or a little bit over 800, depending on whether you want to broadly define IP to include, for example, technology, privacy. And this is international, not just US, right? Uh, I'm thinking more in, in terms of US. Oh, right? so, just in the US, you think yes. there are 800 scholars? So I, I think it's, for those of us who have been actively doing programming, uh, we always have a list of all these members of the different sections within double LS, right? We can actually look at them to actually figure out who they are. But I think a very good way to look at this is when you go to IPSC, you go to WIPIP, you go to some of those bigger conferences, uh, the bigger ones will have close to 200 people. Right, so you can easily think about the number of active scholars. Obviously, uh, some of them are more active pre-tenure, some of them are more active post-tenure, right? So there are different types of people and you uh, gain more people uh, 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 sometimes and you lose some people uh, uh, sometimes as well in terms of who are doing active scholarship. But I do think that there are actually uh, about uh, 200 or so who are uh, uh, very active. Yeah, let me take you up on a comment that you made uh, just a few minutes ago about finding original topics. So there are all these scholars, they're all writing about IP. How would you advise a junior scholar to be able to find an original angle in a field that has up to 800 people considering IP issues? I think it's important for them to look for topics that speak to them. Right, so um, uh, there are certain topics I would pick, uh, and but there's also certain topics I would not. Right, if whatever I do, I try to uh, go for something where I actually know a little bit more than uh, my peers. Uh, I can actually make an important contribution because I'm so interested in a topic that I'm willing to do extra work, uh, whether to find out the culture of a certain uh, country or the history or other things that I can add to my international ID scholarship, or I go into a background of uh, the negotiation behind some of the treaties to see what are the compromises they made, why they disagree with each other. I've been doing a lot of work on uh, the divide between developed and developing countries, right? That actually requires you to go beyond just the particular topic to actually learn about things that may be useful or may not be useful, right? So uh, the more, you pick a topic that will be uh, uh, that will speak to you. The more likely you'll be willing to do extra work in order to provide something new. Uh, I think the difficulty for most junior scholars is that they want to do something new. Uh, they want to do something that is uh, not done by others, but they are also concerned about promotion and tenure and writing about things that are not widely uh, explored by others will make it much more difficult for you to have a conversation with them uh, in your scholarship 
uh, will make it more difficult for you to find external reviewers down the road. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of people also want to build on scholarship that has been done by some of the leaders so that you can actually uh, uh, be part of the, uh, the debate so that you can actually participate in, uh, in it. And so I think uh, those constraints will actually make it much more difficult for people to, uh, to pick the topics. I think anytime people are eager to actually do something different, uh, they can be either very successful 10 years from now, or they can actually be uh, uh, somewhat uh, restricted in terms of their career development due to the lack of people who are actually engaging in the same conversation, right? So I, it's, it's actually a very uh, difficult choice, I think, for a lot of uh, junior scholars in terms of uh, what topic they want to write about. I think there's also uh, the constraint that is uh, looming over all of us, right? Whether the student editors will actually appreciate the topic. And so even if you get the support from senior colleagues, you got the support from other colleagues outside discipline. Uh, there's a good chance that the student editors may not understand what you're writing. And ultimately, uh, where you place your articles uh, and how often they got cited will uh, be a factor into any consideration for tenure and promotion. So let's talk about co-authorship. John is not only a commentator on your scholarship, he is a collaborator with you. And he says, that uh, it turns out we write much in the same style, which makes collaboration much easier. Uh, what is that style, first of all? So I'm very lucky uh, to have John as a co-author because uh, he and I work very well uh, on a number of projects and uh, I hope we can continue uh, this collaboration uh, in the future. Um, I think the style is probably that um, I think we write, uh, we like to break down complex issues uh, into a way that we can make it easy for people to understand. Uh, we don't throw a lot of uh, jargons or um, a lot of, um, um, I don't know, a, a lot of other things we usually do to package our scholarship so that it actually uh, looks more scholarly. I think uh, we try to go into the question, we provide examples, uh, and we also have a uh, um, more comparative or international take on certain issues. So for example, when we were, uh, when John and I were writing about uh, competition law and copyright misuse, uh, he was looking at US and Canada. Uh, when I'm writing a lot about intellectual property issues, I always look to Asia, I look to developing countries. And I think that will enrich our perspective. So I think we write uh, in a similar way. Um, it's actually very difficult for me to find co-author because I'm perfectionist. So um, I'm, I'm glad John can tolerate me uh, uh, over the years, uh, but uh, I think, a good point, a good takeaway, I think, for people from this series is that sometimes you find co authors uh, just based on how you interact with others uh, over the years, and then you end up finding them to be great co authors to work with. Uh, if you try to set out to find a co author, sometimes it works very well, sometimes it might not work very well, just because. Uh, you can be interested in the same topics, you can write similarly, and yet you don't necessarily uh, work the same way, right? So uh, some uh, people are very good with that lines. Some people are very good with uh, conceptualizing the piece. Uh, and some, some people are very good at uh, bringing in innovation in the scholarship, uh, but not all of them want you to do the same thing in the same article. So sometimes it actually might work, sometimes it might not. So which one comes first, picking the topic or picking the co-author? I think I've done both. So that is not necessarily uh, an easy question to ask. I think uh, sometimes you are just so interested in scholarship 
of others and you believe that you can actually learn something from others. Uh, and so you would talk to uh, the potential co-author to see if you can work on something together. Uh, but I think you only work well if you actually are interested in learning from others uh, because anytime you try to co-author uh, an article with somebody else, uh, you end up spending double the work uh, to spend double the time to actually do the work uh, on the article uh, in part because you have to uh, do the article the same way as you do, but you also need to make adjustments so that you can actually work with others. And then you also need to review others' work. So you end up spending double the time. So if you're going to uh, select authors, you better select somebody uh, that you want to work with uh, because you're going to learn something, whether it's uh, uh, somebody who works in a field that's different from you or who uh, understands a part of the literature that you don't, or who just uh, somebody who uh, are more senior, who, who are more junior, you believe that uh, you can do some mentoring or you can learn something from uh, being mentored. Uh, and so there are different reasons why you actually would go for it. Uh, I think a better way to do it is you go for a topic uh, because you know for sure that you'll be interested in a topic. Uh, you're not just uh, trying to go for uh, a joint project without thinking uh, why we actually want to do a joint project. Uh, one thing that I would strongly advise people to do is to uh, pick somebody who uh, have been very active, thinking that you can actually split the workload. Uh, that is a, a bad way to think about co-authorship uh, because uh, it may not work well and it can also take more time than you anticipate. So John obviously thought that you are a very memorable co-author. Uh, and you have spoken about John. Can you talk about any other co-authors that are not, noteworthy and how are they similar or different from your experience with John as co-author? I think it's very difficult to, uh, to compare the different co-authors. Uh, and, and I have only collaborated with uh, very few people. I'm hoping that in the future, I can do more collaboration, but as I well, this can be an advertisement. Yes, but as I mentioned <laughs> earlier on, uh, I'm a perfectionist, and I I am not the easiest to work with as a co-author. So I try to make sure that I don't uh, mess up other people's projects. Um, I I think I, I I don't want to get into the different names, uh, but I can uh, uh, share with you some different co-authors. Uh, so some co-authors are very good at accommodating others. They'll finish the project and then they'll let you take the time to do whatever you need to uh, so they can finish it. Others are very strict with deadlines uh, and they want to make sure that the project is good, the train is running and they will actually do their part by the deadline. And so they can be easy to work with in the sense that you don't need to reschedule things just to accommodate your co-authors. Uh, and they will also do their part. Uh, I think some co-authors have a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, and to the extent that you actually are very eager uh, to do a lot of work, then you can actually take advantage of a lot of those ideas that can actually help you to have a better product. I think all of them, I enjoy working with them. Uh, it's just very different people and you need to uh, plan the project differently. Uh, I think sometimes it's much more difficult on my end because I'm traveling or I'm doing a number of projects and beating different deadlines. So it's much more difficult for me to work with those who are, uh, are, are more strict with um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the deadlines for, uh, for the writing projects. Uh, but at the same time, I also like those people because if they say that they're going to finish this in July 3rd, they're going to finish this in July 3rd. So you can plan ahead and actually know that uh, July 2nd, you will have time to do other things. Okay. Now, you talk about interdisciplinary research, and John talks about this too. And he mentions that the use of different disciplines greatly strengthens Peter's scholarship and makes it far more valuable to other scholars. Peter's use of different disciplines to critique certain rules of intellectual property law 
helps others look beyond the boundaries of intellectual property law and make similar arguments to critique different rules. And we see more and more of interdisciplinary work these days. Would you say that if you want to be a law professor today, whether in the IP space or elsewhere, being sensitive to um, being open to or even actively pursuing interdisciplinary work is a requirement? I wouldn't say it's a requirement, uh, but I think uh, you will uh, provide a more interesting take uh, on your scholarship. I think it will help you distinguish yourself from other members of academia. I think um, doing interdisciplinary work today uh, is actually very different uh, from the time when I started. Uh, now we have a lot of people who uh, have their PhDs and who have done graduate work in other areas uh, going into the field. Uh, when I started, uh, we do have those people but I think we don't have that many people who have already done a PhD and going into uh, teaching uh, uh, or going back to law school to become a law professor. So I think that's somewhat different. I also think that uh, a lot of the skill set that's been developed over the years about empirical legal research uh, provide a lot of very interesting uh, skills that lead to a uh, scholarship that is usually not done uh, by others who do not have similar training. So I think uh, that actually has enriched the field quite a bit, uh, especially in areas such as intellectual property and technology law. Uh, and I think uh, it's always useful to think about how we can um, engage with other discipline. Uh, the difficulty is that there's some good interdisciplinary scholarship, there's also some bad interdisciplinary scholarship, right? So. Uh, and I think going back to your earlier question about how to select topic, right? If you want to engage in a certain topic, you couldn't find a new angle. Uh, Interdisciplinary scholarship will always allow people to find some new angles. The question is how well you are going to engage with that scholarship and how much hard work uh, you can put in. Uh, I, I don't necessarily think that uh, those who do not have graduate training in our discipline cannot engage with the scholarship, but I think it's very important for them to know uh, their limitations uh, in trying to weigh in on other fields uh, when they are not necessarily trained in that way. Uh, maybe working with a co-author, going back to your earlier question about co-authorship, maybe working with a co-author who has training in other fields, I think that would be useful for those junior scholars who are trying to think about how to do co-authorship before they got tenure. I think that's actually very a good way to do it because any external reviewer can figure out which part is done by that person, which part is done by somebody else. If you're actually working with somebody who's actually very similar to you or who do not necessarily have different skill set, it's much harder for external reviewer to actually figure out uh, what portion has been done by you, even though uh, you always put down the certain percentage when you're actually doing the uh, promotional tenure application. Uh, so I think that can be useful. I think one thing I tried to do when I was running the WIPO journal is to have a special issue for different disciplines. So we started with law and policy, then we go into economics, and then we get into culture, we get into history, we get into um, uh, philosophy, uh, geography. We do go into different disciplines. And my hope at that time is that uh, this will get people to actually think about the discipline of intellectual property differently. Uh, it's, it, I think it's, it, it is, um, I wouldn't say it's coincidence, but it's, uh, it's seem, uh, there's no good reason uh, why intellectual property is limited to law school. Uh, and increasingly, we have seen intellectual property being taught in management schools, uh, in engineering schools, in other places. Uh, and I, I can see why we actually started uh, exploring intellectual property from the law school, in part because of the statutes. Right, but, uh, but I think intellectual property studies is a large, much larger discipline. Uh, so are you, are, are you doing anything like that at Texas A&M in branching out from the law school and integrating the other uh, schools, engineering schools or business schools into your intellectual property program? So we have been doing something like that. Uh, my colleague, uh, Green Lundy, uh, who has a PhD in economics, 
uh, has uh, a split appointment in both the law school and also engineering school. And he has been helping to develop a law minor uh, within the engineering school where we offer uh, 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 some uh, uh, intellectual property classes. Uh, for example, the basics for copyright patent uh, and, and those are the classes that are available uh, to those students. Uh, we also have uh, a non-JD uh, program within IP where they actually come over to do mass health legal studies, where they can uh, learn about intellectual property issues. Uh, so one of the more memorable uh, student I had um, uh, in, that, in that direction is that uh, the student was doing a PhD uh, in uh, plant sciences. And she ends up doing a, 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 a master of jurisprudence uh, admission stage. And she ends up getting uh, a very good career uh, in the intellectual area. Uh, and uh, I think that's a very good example of how we can actually help a lot of uh, people to uh, explore uh, intellectual property with uh, uh, not necessarily within the confines of law school. They can actually uh, go outside the legal context and they can still be very successful in using the knowledge we got from an intellectual property program. You know, this is a good segue to talk about something that uh, John did not talk about in his article, understandably so, because not only are you a scholar, you are also a program builder. And you have been building programs at Cardozo, you've done it at Michigan State, you've done it at Drake, and now at Texas A&M. Most law professors don't want to be program builders. They will say, please give me anything else but being a program builder. Why is that so attractive to you? I think there are different reasons. I think one reason, obviously, we have similar background as well, uh, is if you come from Hong Kong, uh, for myself, or you, you come from Singapore, uh, I think the way we approach scholarship is somewhat different. Uh, the way we um, uh, think about program building is also somewhat different because of just the environment we are in. Uh, so that is actually quite attractive to me uh, in terms of uh, helping to shape the institution. Uh, and trying to uh, market some of our programs, conferences, or scholarship uh, where done by myself or by my colleagues. Uh, so I think that part is just being in a big city where we act, tend to focus more on uh, things that normally uh, are overlooked by, I think, a lot of our uh, peers uh, who are much more into uh, doing the scholarship and not running programs. Um, so I think that is a competitive advantage um, that I have uh, when I first started um, uh, uh, in the academia. And I think it actually uh, helps me to um, move forward, both in terms of my scholarship as well as in terms of uh, working with um, uh, other colleagues about their projects or being a part of uh, the academic effort. Uh, but I. I think I also like the fact that you can actually do much more when you can pull together the resources and you can bring together different people to engage in a debate, right? So uh, at uh, Texas A&M um, uh, last month, we just put together a conference on uh, local creativity and innovation. And we end up with different colleagues talking about what they can do uh, based on this theme in different areas of IP, technology, and entrepreneurship law. Uh, and I think that is quite interesting in the sense that I can not think about all those issues on my own. And uh, I'm basically having a conference that's similar to reading a book where I can learn from others and I can actually get different perspectives. And I think that is something that a program can do, but you cannot do as an individual scholar. And one of the things that I learned in reading your CV was that you started along with Bobby Qual from DePaul, IPSC. And of course, IPSC today is probably the most famous IP conference among IP scholars, not just in the US, but around the world. Uh, walk us through the beginning of IPSC. What inspired you to do it? How did you get connected with Bobby Qual to do it? And how did you grow? The event to the way the scale and the level of success that it has today. 
So a lot of credit has to go to Bobby. Uh, and uh, she came up with the idea and she approached my mentor, uh, who was also a director at Cardozo IT program at that time, Marcy Hamilton. Uh, and so I was working closely with Marcy. Uh, at that time, uh, she was doing a lot of scholarship uh, in the law and religion area. And I have been uh, working closely with her uh, in the intellectual part program. I also uh, was her student in some of uh, uh, the different classes. And then um, uh, I got a chance to uh, get that, get this idea and work closely with Bobby in developing it. Uh, so when we initially started, I think the idea was that um, there are different schools who uh, bring together different people for their faculty talks. Uh, but increase, uh, but when we go to faculty talks, we don't necessarily get the um, feedback that we want. A lot of times, because people are not engaged in intellectual property scholarship, they will ask you questions about, can you just get me down to the basics? Well, how does the pattern work, right? So you end up spending a lot of time uh, going into a lot of those foundational issues that will be helpful uh, for the talk, but not necessarily helpful for your scholarship. So uh, one idea is to, why, why don't we have a group of people who can get together to actually uh, be at the same wavelength and be able to actually provide feedback at a high level uh, so you will just be much more effective that way. So that's one reason. I think another reason is that because the way it's set up for a lot of schools, a lot of the school, uh, bigger schools, they tend to have their own uh, faculty exchange and leaving uh, a lot of those other schools behind in terms of how they have the opportunity to actually uh, engage with others. Sometimes it's because of uh, the lack of resources, sometimes because of lack of events for them to get together. Uh, uh, people cannot wait until uh, January when they go to the WLS conference to, or the mid-year meeting or some other uh, venues at that time. And uh, IPSC is a very good way to bring people together so that they talk about IP scholarship. And so that's why we do it that way. Uh, I think a third reason, uh, if I remember correctly, is that we also want to find some way to distinguish uh, the program at DePaul, at uh, Cardozo, uh, in a way that showcase what we've been doing in the IP field. And so uh, the original plan is to actually have three different schools, uh, one on the East Coast, that's Cardozo, one in the Midwest, that's uh, DePaul, and then one on the West. Uh, and uh, we approach uh, uh, one school, and that school was not too interested at that time uh, to do this type of collaboration. So we end up deciding to actually go ahead uh, with both Cardozo and DePaul. And um, uh, uh, surprisingly, uh, when we were doing the event, uh, Mark Lamney, who was basically, who is now basically uh, the scholar everybody talks about in terms of IT scholarship, uh, was visiting uh, at Chicago uh, to speak at the ABA conference. And we were lucky enough to actually get him to join us uh, to actually uh, uh, present the paper and then to uh, hang out with the group. Uh, we were doing uh, the event with, um, I believe, uh, about a dozen, uh, probably a little bit more, I think 14 or so uh, scholars just in the rare book room uh, in the uh, law library at DePaul. Uh, we basically fit everybody within the same room. We have a, a nice round table. We get together to talk about it. I think in the second conference I organized at Cardozo, we also were able to fit everybody within the, uh, 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 the conference room uh, where uh, people can sit around and do it with no uh, parallel session. Uh, so, uh, and uh, at that event, uh, uh, Mark asked if Berkeley can join. Uh, and so we were very lucky to actually find a what's a partner from the West Coast that way. Uh, and I think um, we, uh, we, we are more than excited because I think based on what I said early on, uh, our original plan is to focus on schools that would uh, normally not be considered for those big faculty talks or faculty exchange programs. And Berkeley is one of those schools where they already have a well-established uh, exchange programs where people are doing uh, scholarship exchange or engaging in that area. Uh, so, the yeah. Go ahead. So no, I think so. I think it works out very well. Uh, and we end up with uh, Cardozo, DePaul, and Berkeley. Uh, and uh, when Mark moved to Stanford, and Stanford joined, and who would say no to Stanford? 
right? So I think it, it works out very well. And I think the the idea is that we they would do uh, one year on the West Coast and the other year on either East Coast or the Midwest. Uh, and so we end up doing the rotation that way. And I think this is a very good setup with four different schools. I think um, uh, it's very difficult uh, to run uh, IPSC these days, uh, given the resources you need to put in, given the number of speakers who are actually uh, actively uh, uh, participating. So I How think, many speakers these days? I think it's between, uh, I would say 120 uh, to 200 before the pandemic. For pandemics are a little bit more complicated depending on whether you allow for hybrid, you allow- You can't for fit them into a round table in a library anymore. No, I don't think that would uh, ever happen again, even uh, for scholars who are trying to do uh, individual areas. Uh, so um, I think when uh, the work in progress in internet uh, 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 or, or the internet work in progress conference started, uh, we still have parallel sessions. We are not able to do that. Now, there are still some round tables that we have seen for, uh, for copyright, for trademark, uh, for probably now AI and robotics. You can still find a lot of those round tables, but that's closer to uh, by invitation seminar. Uh, that's not necessarily uh, a, a broad call for paper for anybody interested. Uh, and so I think if we are going to do uh, a CFP and then uh, uh, make it available to every uh, IB professor or every professor in a certain field. I think it's much harder to do it. I think PACCON is a very good example, right? Within pattern field, uh, we end up with a lot of different uh, uh, scholars participating. Uh, so I, I think it's much harder to do it that way unless you do it by invitation. So um, with 200. Yeah, yeah so okay. yeah. no, I think there are both good and bad things about IPSC. Um, uh, the good thing, obviously, is we now have a very good forum to explore ideas, um, uh, especially just before we begin our semester. Uh, the bad thing, if I have to say it that way, and I, I actually want to get it in the series so that uh, other uh, junior colleagues who are listening uh, to this podcast will be able to, to, to see this, is that a lot of junior colleagues are now getting used to uh, do only work in progress event. And when we do, for example, a theme-based conference, they will still do a work in progress uh, presentation. Uh, that is not necessarily tied to a conference theme. And uh, having been in the early days where we got IB conferences that are always theme-based, they're always organized by law review, uh, I miss that type of interaction where everybody I basically talk about the same topic. Uh, so I don't know whether it's good or bad. I think on balance, it's definitely good uh, because we got more people who are active in IB scholarship and we also get a, 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 a time for us to connect with others. Uh, uh, summer for IPSC uh, and then spring for WIPIP. And then once in a while, we have other conference, including the, uh, the round table we do here at uh, Texas a and uh, But I also meet having uh, a lot of those conferences that are based around a certain theme where everybody basically talk about the same issue. They uh, done the research in those areas and we prepare to talk about it as opposed to just look around to see what you are writing now and then try to present it. So it sounds like the trade-off in the success of IPSC with now 200 people at the conference is that you don't really get the same level of feedback, which was really the impetus for IPSC in the first place. Is that fair to say? I think that's fair to say, but I think there's also an institutional side of it. Uh, and most of the institutions at that time are not doing a lot of IP conferences. Uh, and it's not the easiest to get a lot of the main law reviews uh, to actually do a conference on uh, IP. And so without those events, then uh, you basically have to rely on uh, the panel at WLS or when they do a mid-year meeting, uh, or, uh, or once in a while you, spoke, uh, you speak at uh, AIPLA, you speak at uh, ABA, uh, hoping that the practitioners will actually want you to engage in more academic conversations, right? So uh, I think there, one, uh, one of the uh, impetus behind IPSC is that 
we get different institutions together so that every year there'll be at least a big IP conference where everybody can actually um, engage with others. Obviously, when you engage with others, you get feedback, right? So uh, I think uh, those goes hand in hand with each other, but I think uh, there's both the, uh, what we need as a scholar, uh, there's also another aspect with respect to institutions. So talking about institutions, you now have four. DePaul, you have uh, Cardozo, you have Stanford, and you have got Berkeley. You have other law schools come up to you and say, we want to be part of this club as well, especially seeing how successful it's become. So I have not been involved with uh, IPSC after I left uh, uh, Cardozo. And so I think that's a much better question for- Draw like Texas A&M, for example. Sure. So you could be part of the club if you want yeah, to. So, so I'll get to that. So, uh, but going to IPSC, I think if I were looking at it as an outsider or as a co-founder, I think uh, right now having four institutions is already, uh, uh, I think it's already quite challenging to do a rotation. Uh, because you don't get the conference to go back to your institution until uh, four years later, right? So I think it's much harder uh, for you to bring in different institutions. Uh, we have seen WIPIP rotating between different institutions, uh, and there's always uh, complications moves back to um, to who gets to host uh, the event and also how long you need to wait uh, in the pipeline uh, in order to do that. Uh, I think there, I think uh, it's a good idea to uh, do collaboration, uh, but, but ultimately, if you are the program director, you have to ask yourself why you want to engage in the partnership. Uh, if you want to boost the profile of your program, uh, how many institutions do you want to include, right? Uh, it, it, so one of the reasons why I think a lot of schools are now moving to work in progress events and they don't do a lot of theme-based events is because uh, the financial formula is just more attractive. It's a pay-as-you-go event. You pay for uh, uh, the meals and then people pay for the hotel and airfare, right? And that's why I kind of miss that type of conference uh, that's around a theme because it's actually very costly to put to a conference. I just look at the, the bills I got uh, for the uh, recent conference I did. Right, it's just not uh, the cheapest way to actually run an operation. Uh, but at the same time, uh, having people to come in to just present the latest research, uh, that is good if there's only one event uh, or two events every year. Uh, but when you hear the same presentation the third time or fourth time, uh, it sometimes becomes uh, much more frustrating. Uh, obviously, uh, there's also benefit to it uh, because of parallel sessions. Sometimes when we go to IPSC, we don't get to ch the chance to actually uh, listen to that presentation. So by the time we go to WebPay, when people present again, we're actually very happy that we get a chance to do that. Uh, but I think uh, ultimately, any time you want to think about whether you want to uh, do partnership with other schools, I think you need to think about, well, do you want to do partnership for the sake of uh, uh, engaging with others so they can actually uh, create a bigger project? Or do you want to raise the profile of your school? Uh, do you want to actually split the cost so that you don't need to bear heavy burden every year? I think those are important considerations, but how you answer those questions will actually give you, get you very different outcome in terms of how many partners you want to have or whether you want to partner with others. Thanks. So I want to come back to the theme of leadership and focus on two specific areas that we have talked about, um, building programs and partnerships on one hand, and the other one is scholarship. What does leadership in each of those fields look like to you? I think that's a very difficult question uh, because uh, I think we have different definition of leaders. Sometimes we look at leaders to provide the inspiration Sometimes we look at leaders to uh, be the MVP within the field. Uh, sometimes we look at leader to be able to motivate others, empower others to do things they normally cannot do, but they uh, have the uh, potential or capability to do it. Uh, so I think uh, it's really difficult to talk about 
uh, what's considered as a leader. And the way I look at it is that different people are leaders at different times. Uh, sometimes you lead, sometimes you follow, right? Uh, and so uh, any good leader will be able to know how to follow, right? So I have a lot of respect uh, of all the other program directors because it's easy for us to say uh, what they should do more, uh, how they should do things differently. And it's much harder to actually figure out uh, how to make adjustment when you have other constraints whether it's internal within the institution or whether external because of the topic or because of uh, uh, the participants or some angry email you got from uh, other stakeholders, right? So th th those are constraints that we don't necessarily see, especially uh, for things happening behind the scene. So I think uh, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of program building, I think I would separate that into uh, um, what is internal and what's external to institution. So what's internal uh, to the institution, I think I would see myself as, as the program director more as a coordinator. So I will coordinate different projects. I'll help make sure that uh, I can provide as much information as I can uh, for different people so that they can uh, uh, they can uh, do their job better, or they can have the information they otherwise would not get. Right? One of the things that are quite important as an institutional builder is to actually know who is doing what and who can actually do something well uh, in certain areas. And what I'm hoping to do is to be able to help shape the process in a way so that people will get the information they need, they will get the support they need. Uh, but ultimately, uh, we are in academia where uh, colleagues don't want to uh, take orders from others, right? Uh, and they don't uh, always collaborate with others either, right? I, I myself is a very good example. I do very few collaborations. So I think uh, there are different ways to do it, but I think it's a bad idea for somebody to believe that if I'm the program director, I'm going to direct, right? Uh, it's not going to happen within academia. You're going to work with others to make sure that they can do the project better. Uh, and sometimes uh, uh, just sitting there and listen to them, I think is very important. Uh, and so um, internally, I think that is uh, the, the way I approach leadership. I think externally, I think it depends on uh, what type of things you want to do. Do you want to shape scholarship in a certain way, in a certain direction? Do you want to bring in people who come from different disciplines so they use your program to be a platform so that they can actually get together or to a research hub so that they can actually do different research projects. Uh, Any time when you do partnership with others, if you're thinking about leadership, you lose uh, 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 half of the venture, right? Because uh, if you don't see others as an equal partner, uh, partnerships don't work very well. Uh, and so I think what you can do uh, if you are actually engaging in partnership with others is to actually figure out how you can uh, put together the different uh, uh, resources or uh, institutional capacity to actually make your part of the project better uh, and then contribute ideas so that you can actually develop more synergy uh, with the partners. Uh, but I think, Different people have different uh, leadership styles and different goals. And we have seen so many good examples of very different people being very successful. And when people look at your career, they think, where does Peter get all of these good ideas and insights from? And well, today I have the privilege of asking you, who are your mentors over the last few decades, if you like? even before, if you like starting in academia, who would you say has been formative in how you looked at life, how you looked at how you approach scholarship, how you approach collaboration, how you approach partnerships and institutional building? I think um, we learn from uh, different people uh, at different stages. Uh, I think when I started my career, I learned a lot from uh, two of my mentors, uh, which I mentioned earlier, Noel Price and Master Hamilton. 
Uh, Maru Price is former dean at Cardoso, who basically taught me a lot about institution building. This is a fantastic institution builder. And he was a very successful dean as well. Uh, and so uh, you learn from the best and try to do the best you can. Uh, and then I also learned a lot from Marcy Hamilton. Uh, she's, she has taken the Caruso IP program from the ground up to build a program and then take it to a very high level. I think uh, when I was working with her, we were the top five in the country. And so it's a great program uh, and it still is. And I'm actually very happy that my uh, former colleague, Surab, is now working at Caruso and leading that program. Uh, and I still have fond memories. I just uh, did an article with the uh, Asian Entertainment Law Journal and looking forward to seeing that to go in, into publication. Uh, it's basically about the uh, 100 years of international IP. So it's a very interesting topic. And we have a number of other colleagues joining us as well. Uh, so I, I, I think that helps me uh, to get a better sense of, um, of um, uh, how I should approach the kind of program building and, and, and approach academia. I also learned a lot from other uh, uh, professors and from a colleague at Cardoso, and just looking at how they do it as usual, when you are a vet, when you are a fellow, when you are uh, just an assistant professor, you just look at some of the senior colleagues uh, and you don't necessarily find one particular mentor, you learn from uh, different people from different things. Uh, and I still use some of the teaching techniques of my professors just because I find very effective for me, right? So uh, as I get to more uh, um, the mid-level stage, uh, a year close to uh, tenure or shortly after tenure, I think I get more advice from people who are senior in my field uh, and who give me uh, good advice in different ways. Sometimes it's about scholarship. Sometimes it's about career development. Sometimes it's about making lateral moves and you try to absorb whatever you can from different people. Uh, sometimes it works for, uh, for your mentor, but not work for you. Sometimes it works for you, uh, even though it didn't work for your mentor, right? So I think it's very important for us to actually uh, try to absorb and digest and see what we can learn uh, from others. Uh, and um, and to go a little bit beyond, I think uh, we just look around, be very observant. I think uh, we tend to look at mentorship as one direction. Uh, and I think that might be true if that's the way you define the mentor, right? But if you are talking about whether we actually learn from others, uh, we can learn a lot from the people who are just uh, starting to run programs who are coming with new ideas. And if it works, you know, if, if certain type of conference that you've not seen before works very well, you go there, you enjoy it, you might want to do something similar, right? So you can learn from different places. I think it's very important uh, to know that we keep on learning new things uh, from others. Uh, and uh, I think it's much harder, uh, the more you get senior, the more it's harder for you to, uh, to do things differently in part because uh, there are a lot of sunk costs in terms of how you uh, prepare certain things or how you think is the best and most efficient formula for you to do certain things. So it's adjustment, uh, even if it's good, it might require you to actually spend a lot of time doing adjustment, so eventually you won't do it, right? So I think it's much harder to do it that way. It's easier to learn uh, early on, but at the same time, if there's a good idea, you find it very successful. There's no reason why you should not uh, replicate uh, what others are doing or work with others uh, to see how you can actually uh, do something similar. And second last question related to the earlier question. Now, men mentees. Uh, it sort of brings us right back to the start of this conversation where you talk about investing in other people and building these ties and relationships. What is your view on mentees? and and uh, I, I almost see you as a Confucius figure where you have all these uh, more than dozens, maybe even hundreds of people who would say that you are their mentor, uh, both in the United States and abroad. But I won't put words in your mouth. You tell us, what, what is your view of mentees? Um, and mentorship in that regard. Put, yeah, sure, people. so I think it's important uh, for us to be there for our uh, mentees. Uh, and sometimes they want to talk about things uh, that will affect their decisions. 
uh, whether it's relating to career or whether it's relating to placement uh, or, or just about family politics, right? Sometimes they just want to uh, vent their frustrations. Uh, they are not necessarily uh, trying to actually get some action plan from you, right? So I think it's very important to be there for uh, people and listen to them uh, and, uh, and, and see if you can uh, help them uh, look at things differently. I think it will be useful for us to be able to share our experiences. And that's why I think uh, mentorship doesn't work um, for every parent. Sometimes it works better for some people in part because you live similar experiences. You were able to tell them uh, what happened to you in the past, ask them not to do it again, or ask them to actually do it. Uh, and so uh, I think it, I think it will be useful for, you, for, for us to be able to share our experiences with um, our mentees uh, by, uh, by telling them both uh, the pros and cons, right? So I think it's important to be uh, candid with your mentees because sometimes we want to make sure that uh, we don't talk about the, our own failures. Right, or we want to make sure that uh, our uh, mentees are actually um, um, feel better because uh, uh, we know that they're heading a wrong path, and then we tell them that oh, maybe you should rethink about it, but not tell them that they are heading the wrong path. Right, so I think uh, it will be important for us to be um, candid with them. But I think it's also very important for us to think about how different people are just different. I think we love to try to use mentorship to clone people. Um, but I think that's a very bad idea. And that's actually not good for uh, both scholarship and for academia. Uh, the more diversity we have, the better. We need to appreciate and respect the differences people have. Uh, people may not necessarily do the things you have done, but they can do other things better. Right? I think it's very important for, for us to be able to, um, to see how uh, if how to, I think empathy will be very important, right? Trying to see how we can actually get into uh, the mindset of others to see whether you actually will do the same thing, you, will, you are the same type of person or you are in the same institution. So I think there are different things uh, we can think about mentorship. Uh, I think for those of us who are teaching in IP and technology law, we're very lucky to get into a field that is, um, uh, quite open, uh, that's quite welcoming. And uh, and I'm hoping that uh, whoever I mentor or whoever I help can actually uh, do better and can also pay forward uh, to help others in the future. I think the hope we can have is to actually leave the field uh, better than when we found it and also hope others can actually do the same thing. Uh, and so I think just uh, a very rewarding experience. I think we, a lot of my mentors uh, have helped me without asking for anything in return. So we are hoping that we can actually do the same thing for others. Last question. What is next for Peter Yu? And I invite you to also use this opportunity to pick up on any loose ends or themes that we have not covered that you'd like to touch on. Uh, you don't ask easy questions. Uh, so what's next for me is probably thinking about what's next for me. Uh, it's difficult to think about uh, uh, the next steps after uh, being in the food for uh, more than two decades now, right? I think um, the hardest question a lot of people don't realize, the hardest question is to add in academia is to actually how to get people who are tenured uh, to still have the same motivation uh, as they started in the career. Uh, I think a lot of times we, when we go to uh, events where we actually get together uh, to talk about career development, to talk about mentorship, to talk about uh, how to do better uh, in terms of scholarship or in terms of teaching, uh, we always talk about what should you do uh, so that you can actually uh, uh, get promotion or get tenure. Right. What we don't spend a lot of time to talk about is that uh, what can get people motivated after they get him, after they get a uh, full professorship, or after they get a chair. I think those are actually very difficult questions. 
Uh, and um, I think um, it's important for us to think about uh, what are the things we can do that will actually uh, rejuvenate ourselves. I think for me, uh, if I'm thinking about what's next, I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll probably want to go into a different area that is completely different from what I've been uh, I'm doing. Uh, that has connection with IP so that I can actually get into a fresh new area so that I can actually develop some interesting work there. I think that will be quite exciting. I think I want to, um, to think about how we can transform the way we do um, partnerships, we do collaboration with other schools. Uh, I have seen different programs uh, being uh, set up and even for myself or the all four schools I've done, uh, they're all uh, the programs are set up differently, right? So I think uh, it will be interesting for me to see whether we can actually transform academic partnership in a different way that I've not seen before. Maybe it's at the global level, right? Maybe it's at the uh, uh, cross school level so that we work with, uh, I don't know, 10 different schools at the same time. I think that would be quite interesting. Uh, I'm hoping that I can do more collaborations with others. Uh, and um, I'm still uh, approaching that cautiously. I know that I want to do it, but at the same time, I also uh, don't want to um, have a bad experience just based on how uh, demanding I am uh, to myself as well as how much a perfectionist I am. Uh, but I, I, I do hope that I can actually work with more people so that I can actually um, have a different experience, learn from them, uh, do something interesting. And again, we can advertise and say, please contact Peter Yu if you are interested with the caveat that he's a perfectionist. So you come in with your eyes open. <laughs> well, thank you, Peter, for this privilege of speaking with you. It's uh, been a, you've had a most extraordinary career. And I think uh, many people listening, even those who know you, including myself, are just starting to learn new aspects about you. And we thank you for the contributions you have made in so many areas. And we look forward to that next chapter for Peter Yu uh, in all of those areas. So thank you very much and uh, all the best for that next chapter.